In Governor Kathy Hochul's State of the State and Budget Addresses earlier this year, she's repeatedly highlighted the importance of responding to the mental health needs of New Yorkers, and to that end, she's looking to make major investments into the state's mental health infrastructure and services. For more on what this could and should look like in the state's final budget, whenever we get that, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Matthew Shapiro, Senior Director of Government Affairs for the New York Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. And also in the studio is Glenn Liebman, CEO of the Mental Health Association of New York State. Thanks for joining us again, Glenn. Glad to be here. Thank you. So, Matt, I want to start with you and this issue that you've raised about ensuring that private insurance is mandated to cover some of the same mental health services uh, that might otherwise be covered for, by Medicaid or other public health insurance coverage. Can you explain what's a- at issue here compared to the governor's plan and what's being debated right now as part of budget negotiations? What we really want to see is insurance parity. And what I mean by parity is, as you said, having fi- psychiatric issues covered the same way physical issues would be covered and, and have those services billable and have really network adequacy that everyone who has private insurances can get psychiatric coverage the same way you would under Medicaid. A lot Now, a lot of the services are only billable to Medicaid. And what are the types of services we're talking about? Specifically in the governor's budget, a lot of the, the big advancements that she's making, like the school-based clinics and the mobile teams and the crisis stabilization centers, we need to make sure that all of those are covered by private insurance. Right now, they're only Medicaid eligible, and that's a big concern. And so are there no private insurance plans that will be covering this? Is that why we need a mandate? Or is the case that that some plans might cover these mental health services? It's possible that some, but we need it to be across the the board and, and make sure that everyone who has private insurance can get coverage. I mean, I can tell you in my own case, you know, I'm someone who receives psychiatric services. I have a psychiatric provider here in the Capital District. And when I needed a little more talk therapy, I asked my psychiatrist who prescribes my medication, is there a a therapist I can talk to? And he said, sure, we have 15 in the office. Go and make an appointment. Of the 15, only one of them took my insurance and I had to wait seven weeks to get an appointment. That seven-week period could have been disastrous. and, And that's really the types of things we're seeing and that we're so concerned about, that someone shouldn't have to wait seven weeks because it's so hard to find uh, a provider that takes your your insurance. If the state is going to mandate additional services be covered, health insurance providers are going to say that this will drive up the cost of health insurance. How do you respond to that? Legally, right now, there's supposed to be parity, and it's, it's on the books. So it's really enforcing what's already on the books. If you're paying for insurance, you want to make sure that everything's covered. You know, the brain is a part of the body as anything else, so it doesn't really make sense that you would cover my leg, but you won't cover my head. And, and you know, I, I don't think it would drive up prices that much. That's always the excuse that they use. But bottom line is if you want to get what you pay for, and, and you want the full body covered, and that's what we're so concerned about. Well, so if the parity is already required, does this mean that we should just have the Department of Financial Services be more actively policing this issue and ensuring there is coverage? That's exactly what we're looking for, because that's where it is on the Department of Financial Services. There's oversight of this. So we want further oversight and and really accountability for the plans to do what they're supposed to do and cover uh, psychiatric issues the same way physical issues are covered. So, Glenn, turning to your priorities yeah. right now, besides spending time with me and watching the Mets, what are you focusing on in the state budget? School-based mental health services. So there are about 1,200 school-based mental health programs around the state. They're basically clinics, for the most part, in schools. Some are satellite offices. But we know about the crisis with young people and everything going on with them in terms of their anxiety, depression, and there is such an increase, and there are now 1,200 of these school-based programs out there, which is essentially having a clinician in the school, which is great and something we've long advocated for. And the thing of it is, is the insurance coverage. If you have Medicaid, if you're a young person, you have Medicaid and you go in and, and need those services, they're paid for. You have a commercial insurance plan and you go in, all of a sudden your parents are getting billed for this. And it's, it's not fair when you have this kind of crisis level services that you need this kind of response. And all of a sudden, parents are paying out of pocket for it. So the governor has put together what we think is a very laudable proposal here to basically say, we're going to treat commercial plans the same way we're going to treat Medicaid. This has real implications for a school-based mental health clinic. So that's something we're really pushing for. 
in terms of other priorities, well, you know, Dave, what I'm going to say, the 8.5% cost of living adjustment. For the entire human service workforce, it's not just for mental health, though obviously we advocate for mental health because that's our world, but it's the entire human service workforce because they touch on mental health services as well. So basically what we're looking for is the governor put in 2.5% in the budget, which, again, is a recognition, which is important because last year she had it 5.4, first governor due two years in a row. But as we know, the uh, cost of living has gone up dramatically. It's at 8.5%. The CPI is at 8.5%. Both the Assembly and Senate put in 8.5% into the budget, which is great. Now we just want to make sure that in final negotiations that that 8.5% stays. The workforce, as we know, around issues around retention and recruitment is at a crisis level across the human service sector, across the mental health sector. People are, are working hard and they're getting paid $15 an hour, they could go work at Target or wherever for a similar salary. So why would they stay in mental health? They, they stay because they believe in the mission. But as we say, the mission doesn't put food on the table. You have to get some actual real money to be able to stay and make this a career. And is there reason to believe, though, that investing hundreds of millions of dollars into a cost of living adjustment will actually have a demonstrable effect on workforce recruitment and retention? Because if not, if there are other things that we could spend the money on that might have a more significant benefit, should we be focusing on those investments instead? These investments are, are the way to go because it, it seems to me that it incents people, when you're getting a, an 8.5% COLA, it incents people to stay in the field. It's almost, you know, and then on the 5.4 from last year, that's almost a 13%, almost 14% increase. That incents people to stay in the field. I think it does respond to the need that's out there, that people are, are recognizing that these are viable fields. I can make a career out of being in the human service field. They're direct care workers who are, you know, dealing with the stuff every day, dealing with the trauma, dealing with everything they have to deal with, and they're working for people to recover and for us to pay them basically $15, $16 an hour is just like, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Well, Matt, I want to turn now to the capacity of the state to actually meet the mental health needs of New Yorkers, and specifically this issue of psychiatric beds in hospitals. The governor has been proposing kind of a, a stick approach to the carrot and stick of ensuring we have psychiatric beds in hospitals. Can you talk about what you're hoping uh, will end up in the state budget to, to ensure there are some of these beds? Sure. And thank you. That's such an important issue. I mean, obviously for NAMI, access is our biggest issue. And, and whether it's community services and making sure we have a workforce, like, like Glenn said, or the hospital beds are such an important part of this. And, and we don't want to go back to yesterday or yesteryear where we were over-relying on hospitals and asylums and things like that. We don't want to see hospitals overused. We want to see them used more effectively. And, and one of the things we really praise the governor for is her determination to return hospital beds back online. Over the last decade, we've lost 1,800 hospital beds, both in the private and public system. And last year, the governor started to address that, address the Medicaid reimbursement rates by investing $27.5 million to improve the reimbursements that hospitals get. But we lost a lot of beds during COVID, during our Governor Cuomo's mandate that 30% of hospital beds need to be made available for a surge. Hospitals disproportionately targeted psychiatric and detox beds to meet that mandate. And now that that mandate's over, we don't see those beds coming back online. I mean, for instance, down in Kingston, the psychiatric unit was the only in patient provider for three counties. That unit went offline during COVID, hasn't come back yet. So now we have three counties that are dependent on inpatient care that don't have it. And again, one of the, the byproducts of this are people getting moved all over the state to access a bed, separating them from their family and their support. So what the governor is really trying to do is hold hospitals accountable, the same way she's trying to hold insurance companies accountable to do the right thing and provide the care they're supposed to. So we're very supportive of her efforts to find the hospitals $2,000 a day for returning these specific beds that were lost to COVID and not bringing them back online. And, and we're disappointed not to see that same sort of commitment in the legislature. Is there any flexibility in the governor or Senate's plans in terms of recognizing maybe extenuating circumstances that might uh, make it impossible for some of these beds to come back online? Or, or is there uh, just a, a strict, you need to bring these beds uh, back into use or else you're going to face a fine? 
I'm pretty sure it's the, it's the latter. And, you know, we understand. I mean, we're realistic. I mean, Glenn talked about the, the staffing rates uh, in, in, the public, in the community services. And, of course, we want to care for those who care for us. And I know staffing for hospitals has been an issue. But the bottom line is, is that we do need the beds and, and we do need that access. So, Glenn, I want to turn to another workforce issue. And this has to do with, I guess, creating new opportunities in the workforce, in the mental health industry. Can you talk about something that's kicked up some backlash for concerns about scope of practice expansion, but it also would create new opportunities? What's going on there based on my vague and ambiguous uh, introduction? (laughs) So the Office of Mental Health, and we praise them for the praise of the governor and the Office of Mental Health for this. They have said that we have to create a, a program that essentially is a stepping stone for people who want careers in the mental health world, who are power professionals, graduate high school, or maybe they have their associate's degree and want to stay in the mental health field. A lot of times you stay in the mental health field to become clinicians. Totally appropriate. That's great. But uh, there is not, for a lot of people, there is not that kind of career ladder that they could have if they enter the field as a paraprofessional, they get the appropriate training, they work under the supervision of a clinician, they work with the individual and the clinician around development of the treatment plan, around engaging them, around maybe some care management with them, around group therapy with them, those kinds of things that are not clinically driven, they're not driven by a diagnosis, they're not you know, Dean diagnosticians or anything like that, they are working primarily to help an individual in their process of recovery. It's a win-win because, you know, as we advocate for more people to be in our field and to create the space in our field, this is a great opportunity because it creates a career ladder. You go and you, you are there for a year or so and you get the training, appropriate training, then you move up the ladder. Then you're, you know, your work experience, it's much like a KSEC in substance use world where basically you, they call it a KSEC T the first, you know, after you get your degree, your one-year degree. Then after you get 6,000 hours, you become a full-time KSEC, which is actually leads up the ladder. There's a career ladder for that individual. And it's a real choice. And so for a lot of people, we're missing a lot of people in our field who are just sort of like, okay, you know, what am I going to do? I have my high school degree. I have my two-year degree. What am I going to do? But I want to be in mental health. This creates that opportunity. And the second fold piece of it is it's a great recruitment for an agency because now all of a sudden they have another person that they can hire who is going to be, you know, making a decent salary, not like, you know, a clinical salary, but they're making a decent salary and they can help in terms of working with individuals and having people recover and move forward in their lives. That's what it is. So it's a, it's a, it's a win-win. I think the issue from a lot of the, you know, the groups is about scope of practice. I think that it clearly is not a scope of practice issue. These people are not going to diagnose or anything like that, much like a KSAC. It's not like it hasn't been done before. So we look at this and we say, this is a win-win for everybody. How come this is in the final budget? Well, we, you know, we'll see what happens in the final budget, but it should be in the final budget. Well, we've been speaking with Glenn Liebman. He's the CEO of the Mental Health Association of New York State. Thanks for joining us, Glenn. Sure, David. And also with us in the studio has been Matthew Shapiro, Senior Director of Government Affairs for the New York Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Thanks for making the time, Matt. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, David. Is your business, agency, or service interested in delivering your message to more than two dozen radio stations statewide carrying Capital Press Room? If so, visit capitalpressroom.org to contact our underwriting team.